My name is Eric Van Horn. I bought my first franchise in my 20s, and since then, I've owned six brands with 25 stores in eight states. I've also helped a thousand people find the right franchise for them. People like us who are not cut out for the nine to five and like to work smarter, not harder. How do we find the right franchise, buy it, grow it, sell it, and how do we do it in a way to own the business without it owning us? Those are the questions, and I'm on a mission to give you the answers. Welcome to Franchise Secrets. Welcome to the Franchise Secrets Podcast with your host, Eric Van Horn, and today's guest is Robert Bruski, just like the beer, and we are going to be talking franchising, like going from Canada's version of Wall Street into inventing stuff and do becoming a franchisor in one of the coolest spaces of virtual reality. And I'm glad I said it the right way. I'm probably going to say VR the rest of the podcast, but Robert, I've, I've seen you, I've heard you, I've been excited to get you on the show. So welcome. Yo, it's shaking big Papa, Eric. I'm so excited to be here. What's cooking? Oh man, life is good. Life is really, really, really good. Awesome. So dude, take us back. Like, how did you get started? Take us, well, first of all, tell us, the, I want to start differently than I start with some guests. I want to know the name of the company, what it is, and what is a customer experience when they walk in. That way, all the listeners know what we're talking about. Sure. Okay. So the name of the company is Control V. It's spelt like the control button on your keyboard, C-T-R-L, and then the, the letter V. You can find it in Canada at controlv.ca or in the US at controlvarcade.com. And basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a virtual reality arcade. People come in and pay by the hour and have an all-you-can-eat buffet of virtual reality experiences, games, educational stuff, swimming with whales, shooting zombies, whatever it is. Um, but we specifically focus not so much on the tech, but more so on the customer experience. I like to say... We sell happiness in the form of VR. I like that. So if they come in, is it is it uh, the customers or people that don't have the VR equipment at home? Is it off the shelf type stuff that's really like good and has the power to be able to make a great experience? Or is this something that is is not just off the shelf? Yeah, man. Uh, so it's it is off the shelf, but we buy them much more expensive stuff, mm -hmm. which is a couple thousand dollars. You can buy stuff yep. that's a couple hundred. So you get a much more immersive experience with higher quality. But the customers that come in, for the most part, they don't have it. They may not be able to afford it or they don't have the desire to be able to afford it. But we do get some people that already have it at home and still come in, which is so rocking. Well, because I mean, I think some people think about franchising, everything has to be different. There has to be the 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 goggles that nobody else has or or whatever. So I'm fine with things that you can go buy off the shelf and then you create the experience and you and, and experience is like you're creating happiness in there, right? So you know, so experience can mean a lot of different things, but you you get the stuff that is off the shelf and you're piecing it together, you're giving them everything that they need because most people are gonna be spending thousands of dollars on VR type of stuff. And if they do, um, you know, that's probably not your customer. So, and, and, but your customers, they probably have the, the, the Oculus go, or, you know, some of them might have that, but the experience that I've heard, like we have the Oculus go here, but the experience at the next level stuff, the next level price point that I was not ready to spend the money on, that's what they get when they go into a control V. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, for sure. But there's one other thing that they kind of get that they don't get at home. And that is the ability to play with friends. You know, if you if you fork out, fork out all this money to buy something expensive, you're taking turns in your household. And then that doesn't mean that your friends got it or can afford it. So you can come in with like a group and, and tag team some zombies if you want. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. I like that. So that's really cool. So that's the brand. That's where you are now. Um, you've been hit by COVID. You've done some really great things as a franchisor. Um, and there's a there's a bright future ahead. I want to get into all of that. But and then I want to get into you as a first time new franchisor. And I know that you have a coach and you are, you know, you're helping people out there and you're just a giver. I want to get into all that, but I want to go back because you were Canada's version of Wall Street before you were control V, right? So go back to the beginning and catch us up to speed. 
Yeah, man. So I worked in Canada's version of Wall Street called Bay Street um, in buy side investment management. So we were generally a hedge fund, but we were really like a like a great place to work. You know, like everyone was friends. The CEO would invite you over to his place and his wife made you like gourmet macaroni and cheese. And it was really cool. And, and we managed some big money, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates, Harry and Larry Rosen. You know, we worked with Warren Buffett. But then there was a bit of a culture shift, the, the leadership change and it started to become a bit more like Wolf of Wall Street and I was like all right this 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 really isn't for me you know um, so I left and I teamed up with a buddy of mine and we created a company called Pipe Dream Interactive um, and we invented a piece of cinema eyewear that was bifocal uh, so we worked with the guys that created uh, 3D and we patented this stuff and we did the rounds in LA you know Warner Brothers Fox Universal Sony you know Robert Downey Jr., J.J. Abrams, all these guys. And eventually, we struck up a deal with one of these uh, um, studios, and we were going to release a movie built around this stuff. You know, we had a deal with a distribution deal with some. Uh, so you were movie. deep down. Do you, were, you at this point, you're deep down the road with this. Like you are spending money and you have buy in. You almost got a deal or you did have a deal. So keep going. I mean, you're deep into it. Yeah, we're so deep into it. And so what happens is we we have an investor who was a celebrity um, and he got accused of some legal uh, legal things that he shouldn't have done. Now, he was ultimately acquitted. Um, he, you know, is a false accusation. But the problem was that now nobody wanted to work with him. And as a result, nobody wanted to work with us. And so we were sitting there in a Tim Hortons, one of these Canadian coffee and donut shops. A, a franchise. <laughs> yes, also a franchise. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, what's next? You know, do we pivot this into gaming? And that's where the idea came around that VR, although it has been around for like 30 years, it was now going to become consumer ready. They announced it at CES and we're like, all right, let's get on this. Let's make it, um, you know, uh, commercial. And so we called the hardware manufacturers and they're like, listen, little boys, nobody's going <laughs> to play this. <laughs> You know, this is going to be in-home stuff. So take your commercial licenses, stop bugging us, and we'll see where you go from there. Next thing, bippity boppity boop, here we are. <laughs> Man, so the, when did you start franchising? Well, t t give us a franchise journey because let's, yeah, I want you and I have spent time on Clubhouse together. If you don't know what Clubhouse is, uh, it's a, it's a social media app. Just check out clubhouse and the app. You have to have a, an Apple device, which everyone should have anyway, but, but, um, you know, check out clubhouse. There's a lot of cool franchise talk going on there. I'm in there, uh, talking from time to time. So is Robert. And that's how we actually got to know each other. Um, so you've been given some great advice on people that are thinking, I've got this great idea. I want to franchise my business and you drop reality bombs to people and really helpful. And so do I, because it's not what everyone thinks it's going to be. And especially when you get punched in the face, like with COVID. So, but I want to understand from you, how, when did you decide to franchise? What was that? What was your thought process like? And think about like, if some, if there's some people in the audience that are thinking about franchising their business. So take it from that angle or franchise ease that are thinking this looks so easy. I should just start a franchise and maybe they should. I was a franchisee. That's how I got started on the franchise or side of things. But you, you know, Walt Bay street, I think you said, is it Bay street? Yep. To Wolf of wall street. Didn't like that into technology, movie, interesting stuff. And then boom, control VR. How did boom control VR happen? Right. So when we opened in June of 2016 and we just went gangbusters right away, Th thing was, everything was so fruitful. Um, you know, we, we were trailblazers. We were creating an industry, not just a brand. And as we built it, you know, other people would jump on the bandwagon, mom and pops would build it and all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't working out so well for them. And we sort of did an analysis and we said, listen, because of the team we've compiled, we have so many different facets of experience. So we've been able to nail this business model, the economics of it, the operations, all that sort of stuff. So we need to grow. Our mission is to help make VR accessible to everyone. So what options do we have? Well, let's see if we can get a bucket of money sitting somewhere in our basement and start opening up <laughs> corporate locations. Did you find you know? a bucket? <laughs> we found a bucket. A big, there was no money bucket? in it. 
<laughs> um, so we're like, all right, this is going to be pretty slow and we sort of need to speed it up because if somebody else goes into our market and damages it, then when we go there, we've got this whole re-education thing that we've got to go through. So what other options do we have? Well, I mean, franchising is an option, you know, we don't know too much about it. I know the valuation component of franchising because of my financial background, but that's it. Um, so we're kind of, you know, chomping at the bit, figuring out what we should do. And then one of our customers shows up and says, hey, guys, I want to buy a franchise. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Okay, so this happens uh, basically two or three months after opening. Okay. Did you, did you ask him how big of a bucket of money he had in his basement? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we do all the financial screening and all that sort of stuff. It's important, right? You got to yep. be financially prepared. <laughs> so you had this customer come in and they're like, I'm ready to buy a franchise and you're not a franchise yet. And so then, then what? Yeah. So then we're like, all right, let's figure this out. This is what entrepreneurs <laughs> do, right? We jump yep. off a cliff and then look for our parachute. Um, so we're like, all right, where do we start? So we called our lawyer and the lawyer is like, all right, well, I can draft up an FDD for you. There's nothing like you. So I'm going to try to take another FDD from an industry that's most similar and alter it. <laughs> all right, so we got this FDD and we know that there's an operations manual and we start picking through it. Eventually this, this guy does sign up and become a franchisee that October. So when did he, like how many months from the time when he first walked in and said, I want to be a franchisee then before he became a franchisee? Yeah, it was four months until he signed Man. and probably six until he was open. Wow, that's pretty fast. That's yeah. really cool. I mean, it's easy to say I want to buy a franchise, but he was serious. Yeah. But you know what? The thing is, he was a customer. So that's testimony mm -hmm. to us providing a good product, right? Customers are huge fans and supporters of your brand. Um, so at that point, we're like, all right, looks like we're going down the franchise route. So what do we need to do? And so we focused a lot on I guess I would call it the back end. So making mm -hmm. sure we have all of the systems developed, the processes, the training, um, you know, the tech, everything that a franchisee needs to um, be supported. Okay. And I think we nailed that. But one thing we, we overlooked, which we later had to turn back and start building on was the, the co coaching or relationship component. And that was one of the missteps that I think as us as franchisors saw was, you know, this isn't just step and repeat. You don't just document everything, sell it, and then collect money. You're mm -hmm. now in the relationship game. They are business partners. All that back end stuff that you've been developing, that's got to be working like clockwork. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's it's their support system, but you're there to build their relationship and help them grow and be profitable. They're your new customer. I mean, as a franchise or you are in the business of helping franchisees become successful. And it's not just a, it's just a system, you know, it goes beyond that. And a lot of times these people that come from corporate America are not like they, they are used to hiring, they're used to firing, but they're not used to doing the types of things when it's their money on the line. So I've always found that interesting too. They're comfortable when it's somebody else's money, somebody else is really responsible for the ultimate decision, not them. But as as a franchisee, now they are putting their money in the line and their decisions impact their business. So you were managing the relationship. So you had, did you develop the systems with him as, as like the guinea pig franchisee, or did you have those kind of developed before he became a franchisee? Um, you know, we, we had a few things developed, but the majority of which we developed with him. Like poor guy, I look back on the, the training that he got and I was like, oh man, this, this was like two days of you just watching us do our stuff. <laughs> now we have 10 days of like <sighs> in class, on the floor, everything, right? Same with, you know, different requests. Like, hey, you guys need a loyalty program or you guys need a membership mm -hmm. system or you guys need to fix this issue that's happening happening to help improve the customer experience. So he, yeah, he was our guinea pig, but ultimately like he was really our business partner, you mm -hmm. know, sharing this information and helping us build this, this awesome company. So he walked into that as a new franchisee, knowing he was, you know, the new guy and you're going to be building it with him. Is that Absolutely. was kind of the expectation? Yeah. 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 He knew it for sure. What was, um, so what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced as you were building, building with him, that first, that first franchisee or the biggest lessons learned? So challenges or lessons? Yeah, I think, um, 
you know, one of, one of the biggest challenges I'll say as a franchisor was um, when you're a franchisor and you enter the, the franchise industry, and I'll say that there's a difference between the franchise business model and the franchise industry. Um, in the industry, there's a lot of sparkly, shiny items. And you're like, oh yeah, I can get that and I can get that and that and that. And next thing you know, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I can't afford all of that. I'm mm-hmm. brand new, you know? So you you need to figure out a way to replicate that, you know? If you need a booking system and there isn't a booking system out there, you've got to figure out a way to work with what exists or create your own. Same with loyalty programs and 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 whatever it is, you know, the the licensing of our games didn't fit into the economics of our business model. So we had to figure out a new licensing system and negotiate it independently with each one of our suppliers and vendors. So that that was a big um, challenge, I think, that that we had to overcome. Um, But I think one of the biggest lessons we learned is that, uh, you know, your, your franchisees really are your business partners, right? It can't be uh, a one-way street, us versus them. It can't be top down. It can't just be talking at them. You know, you 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 have to realize that a franchisee is basically the COO of that location. And you maybe are the CFO or CEO or whatever. So your partners, the same way you would meet with your HQ partners on a weekly or a quarterly basis, you got to do that with your franchisees. Take everything everything that they have. And it contributes to culture too. A lot of people think when culture, it's about staff, but like you said, Eric, essentially your, your franchisees are kind of like your staff, you know, so you're building and implementing a culture there. And if you don't realize that you work for them, you're never, ever going to get the culture that, that you desire. What, so at Mighty Dog Roofing, we are implementing EOS or Entrepreneur Operating System. It comes from the book Traction, who Gina Wickman wrote that. So we use that at the corporate office and we have our roles and we that that's our way of doing things. There's a lot of different ways of doing things, managing different businesses like that. We've chosen EOS as, as our model. We're also doing that with our franchisees. So it's the traction, the entrepreneur operating system that we are going to manage our, with our franchisees to have meetings and KPIs and, and all of that. So they know what to do. And I think that's going to help them manage their business because hopefully they're going to do the same thing with their team as well. Well, so give us an idea of like what you've seen that works as um, as support for your franchisees because you mentioned some different maybe meetings maybe it's weekly or monthly or things like that. What have you found that works well for you as a franchisor and your franchisees really like or at least they see results by doing it? Yeah, man, we use we use traction as well. Um, we didn't we didn't deploy it until about a year or two into it. We we were told about it from uh, Angela Cote and Dan Monahan. They both informed. And we're like, all right, let's try it. But it's a great base, right? Like it's written like a manual, which I love, not like a, you know, existential business sort of mm-hmm. novel. And you can deploy that stuff. But it it really focuses on, like you said, the operating system. It doesn't so much focus on the relationship. So to touch on your question about support, I found that um, when a franchisor builds, I'm going to be very intentional with my words here. When a franchisor builds support systems, they kind of act as a 1-800 number, you know? So, hey, you you need tech problems? We'll help you. We'll have a troubleshooting guide. We'll have, you know, a knowledge base where you can go, hey, you need help with marketing? We've developed this ROI tracking spreadsheet and all the assets and all that sort of stuff, but it's up to you to use it. So you, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't necessarily make it drink, right? So to me, that is the support. Um, but there's a second component to that, which... I guess for lack of a better word, I'll call coaching because um, you mean, I mean, there's specific types of coaching where you hire a professional to coach the franchisees, but that sort of coaching consulting relationship from the franchisor to the franchisee is more relationship building. So following up with them every week, checking in, how's it going? Hey, you just had a child, you know, how are you and your wife doing? You know, how's the health of the baby? Um, Hey, I heard you guys had a massive tornado rip through your state. Is everything okay? Like it's building a relationship. Now, is there anything I can do? Or listen, dude, you just had a rock star week in sales. Do you want to get on a call and follow up and see what went well and what didn't so we can recalibrate and keep moving forward? That's, that's such a critical component so critical i i would 
somewhat apprehensively say that that may be even more critical than the support that I was talking mm -hmm. about. So with that, how does that look as a, you as a, uh, uh, a younger growing or emerging franchise, or you have, I believe 12 locations right now. Is that, is that you, is that a, one of your partners or is that one of the support staff that is doing that or a combination? You know what? I would say that as a young emerging franchisor, it is important for um, like the founder, the, the, the founders to be that person. Because um, I think it's a, it's a rule of thumb that the Fran dev person or the person who does a sales or, or closes a sales is the founder. So ultimately your franchisee buys into you and your vision, you know, you're selling them on it. So for you to say, all right, awesome, sign here. And now I'm going to hand you over to somebody, you know, when you're bigger and you have to do that, mm -hmm. there is mechanisms on how to do that tactfully but when you're small like like i said you guys are partners so you've got to be that that team that group that builds that relationship and so i i try to instill that within our partnership base and our management base as much as i can what would you tell a franchisee that is wanting to have a good relationship with their franchisor? And maybe they may have it, they may not, but they're thinking, how can I have that a good relationship with my franchisor? What would, as a franchisor, what would you say to that, to that person? Right. All right. Awesome question. <laughs> And by the way, we haven't prepared for any of this stuff, which is <laughs> usual for my podcast. But, you know, the, the way that I like to do podcasts is to, to just do follow up questions and go down a, a, a path, because I think a lot of the questions that I have, I, I get to talk to a lot of people. And so I kind of understand the audience and, and from a franchise or standpoint, from a buyer standpoint and a franchisee standpoint. So as, as you're answering questions, I'm always kind of filtering my next question based off of a buyer, a Z or a Zor. So if you remember the question, go ahead and answer it. All right. All right. Cool. I got it. All right. So if, if I was giving advice to a franchisee specifically on how to build a great relationship with their franchisor, I would say, um, become, become very cognizant and understanding and, uh, knowledgeable about what the franchise relationship is like, you know, um, because I think one of the biggest points of contention that happens in franchise industry is that the franchisee will start to drift off this path where they're like, okay, this is my business. Like I can do whatever I want, you know? And then when the franchisor has to pull them in, they get offended and they may not realize that the franchisor isn't pulling them in because you know, they want to dominate with some sort of tyrannical power. But in fact, the franchisor is trying to protect the brand for all franchisees in the system. So I think if a franchisee understands the, the obligations that a franchisor has, then I think the relationship could be a lot better. And they may also see like, wow, this franchisor is actually going above and beyond um, you know, they don't have to help me with this. And they're here helping with me with this. They're sending out that olive branch. So let's, let's make that awesome relationship. Speaking of, a, uh, of a franchise or going above and beyond, um, and emerging brands. So I hear it often from different, uh, mostly franchise buyers. They are thinking about an emerging brand. They really like whatever it is. It might be the industry. It might be the leadership. It might be a combination of both. And they yet they realize it's an emerging brand, which most franchises are going to be, the, everyone's going to be an emerging brand at some point, right? And then a lot of those don't make it, but that's where a lot of people are buying emerging brands. Even if they've sold a lot of franchises, doesn't necessarily mean it's not an emerging brand brand anymore, right? They're still, they're still growing. So um, the question is, as an emerging, as somebody looking at buying into an emerging brand, what is your philosophy or mindset around helping your first like 10, 15, 20 franchisees in terms of just your mindset around them? Because once you hit a hundred franchisees, you have a pretty large corporate structure. And at that time they're coming into a well-oiled machine and it's just, it's just plug and play for them. It's different, but uh, you know, I know what my mindset is as a new 
of a new franchisee. We just added some more franchisees uh, this week in Mighty Dog Roofing. And I know what we're saying at corporate about these, these new franchisees. In your mind, what was it or what is it when you have a new franchisee coming on board? And okay. they know you're an emerging brand and, they're, and they look at you wide-eyed and they're like, this has got to work for me. Yeah, um, I think so to preface my answer a bit, I think it's important to, that everyone sort of understands that this the success of a franchisor and the ability to bring on more franchisees is so dependent on the success of the first few, right? Mm -hmm. Their profitability, their mindset, their happiness. So I think um, what I do or, or what we at Control V do with, with our first franchisees is we kind of fall into a mindset of realizing that we are in business together, that it's, we haven't just taken their money, that we're there helping them. And when they have struggles, we're going to have struggles. When they can't sleep, we're not going to be able to sleep, you know, creating a culture of compassion and understanding and people focusedness, um, you know, empathy, sympathy, a culture of caring. It, it builds that relationship because now they're not just investing in your business. They're also investing in you and they believe in what you're doing. So they're giving, you know, uh, for us at Mighty Dog, two, $300,000, give or take. And, and, and that's, you know, for a lot of them, that's a lot of money. How much is it at con a control V? About the same, two to About the same. 000. So let's say anybody given a couple, two to $300,000, they're investing into their first brand. That's a massive amount of money. It's a lot of money, period. It's a lot of money to the people that are going into business for the first time, or maybe they're going into, it's a, a diversification play. It's still a lot of money going, going into a business. And I feel the responsibility of that. You feel the responsibility of it. And it's interesting. And it's hard to tell it to a new franchisee like that, but- we have more on the line as a franchise or having you be successful than you even have on the line being successful because what it takes to like, we are just starting the business, right? Any emerging brand is just getting started and they have to make it work. When I say they have to make it work, it means their first 10, 15, 20 franchisees have to make it work for that franchisor to really be long-term successful. And, you know, and that's why a lot of franchises never get to the point of long-term success. So like, in, in my mind, they're thinking, Eric, we, this has got to work for me. And I'm thinking, no, you, you have no idea how much we are going to be helping you to make it work for you because your success is the success of everybody else that's going to be coming when we're at franchise 100 S similar type thought processes you have right yeah man for sure and i think it i think it gets even more stressful for for both the franchisor and the franchisee when the franchisee invests based off of debt and not just the mm -hmm. cash injection because there's usually some sort of collateral and yep. you know um uh like a tax accountant will indicate that debt financing also has a tax shield behind it. So it becomes a little bit more efficient from a tax perspective than just cash financing. So not only are they into this, but they may have leveraged things like mm -hmm. their home or, or their, you know, retirement or whatever it might be. And if they have purchased other stuff or they're leasing different things in a re any, any retail concept, there's going to be some type of most likely some type of personal guarantee on the lease. So there's just a lot that's on the line. Let's go this direction. Um, I've been just watching and reading, diff watching uh, some different uh, shows or videos, and I've been reading some different books and reading some things online, and I'm understanding this, the high performing people are the types of people that they understand the risk, but they are just in there. They, they get in and they're going to fix it. They're going to grind. They're going to work, even though that may not be the end goal. Like I loved, I had the four hour work week for a while. I loved the four hour work week. I got tired of it. Most people try to retire early. I just wanted that four hour work week where I had extreme freedom, but I go in cycles and now we're ramping up horsepower brands and mighty dog roofing. And I'm enjoying getting into the grind and just making it work and some early mornings and late nights and, and things like that, because I know that there's, that there's a, an end to it. And as a business owner, new people coming into it, I think they want the end without the hustle and the grind and the, and the challenges and embracing that. So what are some of your thoughts on that? 
Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I'm kind of the same person. I love that that grind and that hustle. You might be able to see the uh, <laughs> the, the the posters behind me, right? Um, you know that that's part of who I am. You know, somebody mm-hmm. asks you, "How do you identify?" Somebody may identify as like a skier, you know, or or a kind person or whatever. I identify as an entrepreneur, and all mm-hmm. the facets that come along with an entrepreneur. You know, being able to be resilient enough to carry the stress and then get in and grind and hustle. Um, and so, because Control V is an emerging brand, it's an emerging industry. That's one of our 10 um, DNA of a franchisee type of stuff, right? Um, but even if you have this, this mentality of an entrepreneur, sometimes you sort of, you lose it, right? Like mm-hmm. you wake up in the morning and you think about all the struggles that you had in the past and that changes your mindset and you're now living in the past. You're living in all the hurt and pain that you had previously and you need to get over that. You need to think about what the future holds and how you're going to get there and change your mindset from uh, scarcity to abundance so you can reinvigorate that that awesome entrepreneur in you, you know? So I want to um, shift gears uh, again when a when someone goes from research mode to oh my gosh I'm about ready to buy this franchise to actually wiring the money and franchise agreements are signed money's wired i've seen for myself and others there's something that just changes and all of a sudden it goes from should I do this? I have a, I have a parachute. I have a parachute because I don't have to, you know, I might not sign. I might not wire the money to it's done. And now they're all in. And, and I love that. And there's something that, that, that just shifts and, and, and it's, and it's go time with that, with that type of person. What advice would you give that person that's just signed their franchise agreement and they are ready to go? And I'm yeah. sure you've seen it and you will be having more of those. And, you know, especially as we move out of COVID and whatnot, but like, what advice would you give to that person that just signed their franchise agreements and they're with an emerging franchisor? Yeah. Okay. Um, so another one of the the ten, you know, components of the DNA of a successful uh, franchisee is patience. So I love. Is this your book? Is this the future book or <laughs> no? Yeah, coming out the actually, actually, my my franchise coach who is Angela Cote Angela, designed. Yep. Yeah. And so I I've absorbed these now. It's her uh, book. It's her book. Yeah. <laughs> She's great. She's great. Um. So it's patience, right? Because mm-hmm. although. Now my team would would kill me for saying this, but we can get. I'll make sure. Open. I'll make sure I put this on social media, all bold, and I put tens of thousands of dollars of advertising behind it, so your team definitely sees it. So continue. Okay. So <laughs> we can get a franchisee open in two months. My team will be like, Rob, do not say that, right? If that doesn't happen, right? And so the same thing goes for a franchisee. You've got all this vigor and excitement and ready to rock and roll. And I'm and I'm like, you know what? You're probably going to be delayed by your municipality because they have no idea how to zone you. They're going to think you're a water park or a casino. And then there's all these other permits that you need to get and all that jazz. And so I try to figure out a way for them to take that excitement and harness it. And I try to get them to harness it into something that they can do without hurdles or obstacles provided by a third party. And usually that ends up preparing for grand opening through the marketing that you're doing for grand opening. It's hurry up and wait at a lot of times. And we were just having that discussion uh, because we have new franchisees coming on board with Mighty Dog Roofing. And by the way, if you're interested in Control VR, reach out to Robert at, at, how do they reach out to you? Um, I love VR at control V.ca or I love VR at control VRK.com. So if you're interested in muddy dog roofing, go to Eric E R I K at I love franchising.com. <laughs> but it. if you're interested in both, just, just hit me up on a serious note. Um, if you're interested and you want to have a conversation uh, with Robert, that's how you reach him. If I'm getting more and more people from the podcast that are looking at uh, Mighty Dog Roofing, just reach out to me, Eric, E-R-I-K at Mighty Dog Roofing or call with Eric, call with Eric.com. Uh, but anyway, where was I going with all of this? Do you remember? <laughs> no, I have I no idea. We completely distracted. Course. We did. I know where I wanted to go at some point is happiness. And we're going to listen back to this. Oh, 
did you, oh yeah this you were talking about how quickly you can get your franchisees open and then it's hurry up and wait and that's where i was going um as we we're bringing on new franchisees with mighty dog roofing i i would want them to start marketing and doing stuff sooner because i know that's how i am as a franchisee i want to get going and then wisdom came in, Josh Skolenick, uh, one of my co-founders with me, who has a lot of franchise or experience with two brands. He said, wait a second, you know, that's what they want. That's what we really want, but that's not really what works best for most people. Most people, that's what we want, but you have to wait and get the foundation right. What, whatever that it is, certain training or certain things and let them come through training and then go because what difference is it a week or two or three or four really going to make long-term when they are set up with everything correctly. So I appreciated that about him. There's reasons why we have certain things in, in, in place in terms of training and do, you know, you got to walk before you run. You got to, you know, crawl before you walk. And so some of those things need to uh, be in place. And some of it's just the landmines that franchisees don't know about. Like you said, it might just be the city is going to be bringing in some challenges because they just don't know about it. So that's what I, one of the things I love about franchising is us as franchisors, um, we know the pitfalls because we've done it before. And Josh has done it as a franchisor before, but we also have the industry expert part of Mighty Dog Roofing that's done it and seen it before. And that goes for any good franchise. You don't get it into a franchise just to make money faster or have systems and stuff. They're going to prevent, a good franchise is going to prevent pitfalls. Have you seen any other like major pitfalls or, or examples of that, that, that you've seen, whether it's your brand or other brands in terms of saving franchisees time or money? Oh boy. You know what? I, I think that one of the strongest, like the biggest pitfalls that we face is, is always the municipalities. Mm. Um, I, it's probably not common for all brands, but because we're so different, the, the cities just have no idea how to zone us. And so we, we try to solve that. Like we've got like our, our website and our brochures and all that sort of stuff that explain that we aren't one of those 1970s or 1980s arcades that have got a whole bunch of riffraff and trouble hanging around, you know. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll get lawyers involved and real estate agents involved to try to negotiate through this stuff. Um, but I think from a very uh existential level you know not uh the uh, one of the strongest biggest pitfalls that i see is where the franchisor will be like all right we got them in they're trained so they know everything we've given them all the resources they're so excited now rock and roll baby go forth and be fruitful <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, all right, who's next? And you just lose that connection. And then mm -hmm. that person's passion starts to fade away. They get down into the weeds. There's nobody there to, to reinvigorate them. And so that kind of full circle goes back to this whole support versus coaching relationship building type of thing. That's the life of an entrepreneur. That's life in business. I mean, you go through cycles, you go through times where it's like you're, you can run through a brick wall and you go through times where you just can't even get up. You know, it, it just depends what happens. And the more experience that you have, the more stable that you become. And I had a mentor a while, a, a long time ago that said, Eric, don't get too high with the highs or lows with the low with the lows. And so stability and just being able to be um, you know, resilient through a lot of different things. That's why COVID didn't really impact me very much. It, it impacted me, but it didn't impact my mindset. It, I went into how can I help more people? How can I do these different types of things? Because there was impact all around me, but I knew that it was, I wasn't going to let that change how I made decisions and, and, and whatnot. So, but as a new franchisee, as a new business owner, period, and I think that's a Excellent point, because if you are just doing something on your own, you will experience that. And you will probably have to hire some coaches to help you through stuff. And that costs money. A good franchisor is going to be there to help you through that because they know that no matter what you say, you are going to go through different stages of the franchisee franchisor relationship of handling, you know, the ups and the downs with business, because there will be ups and downs period, because that's just the way business is. And the point of it is that the purpose of it is with a franchise 
guys, you can you eliminate a lot of the ups and the downs and you have a go-to place or person or somebody on staff that can help you figure things out so you don't have to do it on your own. And not only just that, but you have franchisees in your system that can help you do the same. I mean, you probably see things very similar, right? Yeah, man, 100%. That's so important. Uh, you've got that support network, so leverage it. And, you know, staying in constant communication with your franchisees um, as a franchisor, if you're if you're self-aware enough and not so much like ego-driven or, or whatever you want to call it, you can foresee when they're hitting that, that wall, you know, and then you know you've got to double down. I got to save this person. So- at the very beginning of the podcast, you mentioned happiness in a sentence that was basically like who you, who you guys are or the, or the result that you're giving your customers. Why don't we go into that a little bit? Because when you, as soon as you said that, it made me think of, you know, Tony over at Zappos, cause they, you know, they were, had a similar type, a similar type mission. I mean, he's, he passed away, but you know, Zappos, I read the book and I know people that have been there and they were around him. And so go into the, the happiness thing. Man, I love happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think, you know, what I say we sell happiness in the form of VR. It's it's a nice sort of slogan and it's kind of alluring, but it's true, you know. Um, you've tried VR, but when, you know, for somebody who hasn't, they come in and they're kind of apprehensive. They're like, I don't know what's going to happen. I've heard people vomit. Nobody's vomited at Control V, but I heard about that. And like, I saw Howie Mandel freaking out because he's afraid of heights and what's this going to be like, you know? So getting them in there and, and being able to be um, sympathetic and empathetic to their apprehensions is so important to them having a good experience. When they leave, they are grinning ear. To, like if they didn't have ears, their smile would go all the way around their head. And so you're, you're fostering this community of happiness focused or, or centered around virtual reality. And so that has to go permeate through the entire company. It's got to be staff franchisees, franchisors, and then that permeates into your life. The, the way you um, interact with your family and friends, you know, various vendors and suppliers, your landlord, you know, you're running down the street and somebody gives you a high because they're also a runner, you know, you're, you're not just like, who is this weirdo? Hey, we both run, you know, um, it totally changes your mindset and your life in everything you do. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, I'll watch some YouTube videos, you know, people talking about stuff, Marie Forleo, Kyle Cease, started watching uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza as well. Um, and sometimes when I speak to people, they're like, okay, yeah, this is all kumbaya stuff. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, but I recently saw a documentary where they've actually been able to... Um, verify this on a scientific level um, using, you know, uh, quantum theory and things like that. You know, when you separate two neutrons and you change the polarity on one, the polarity on another one will change as well. They set up a dark room with a light in the middle and a computer automatically picked a different corner for the light to shine to. And then they put a plant in one of those corners and the light just kind of knew that it needed to provide uh, sustenance for that plant. So all of this like mindset, you know, being, you know, surrounding yourself with great people, which had historically just been considered very kumbaya, ho hokey pokey, is now getting verified and proven scientifically for the left brain community that's out there. And there's just more proof on how this is so valuable to business and everything. So I am Oh, man, listen, I'm so happy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't be happy. All. When w challenge time, like what do you do when you are at a different state? You are, you know, you're down because of something or something that, you know, maybe would have taken you down at some point or a challenge or something really bad happened or might happen. What do you do? Okay, so that happens to me every single morning. When I wake up, my, my, the first thought that goes through my head is, oh, what do I got to take on today? 
Is this going to be the same thing as last week? Do you remember what happened there? That guy wasn't kind of happy. How do I fix that? My phone is going off like a casino. Every every noise, all that sort of stuff. My email inbox, somebody's calling me. Ah, like this starts you got to got a podcast over. to do. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, so what I do is I, um, I, I pray and meditate. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, both uh, sometimes simultaneously, both independently. But m my goal behind that is to try to eliminate all of that noise out of my head that I woke up with. So now when I'm done my prayer and meditation, I can set the focus as to where I go. I don't let my body become a slave to the emotions that I woke up with. My brain tells my body, now you will obey. <laughs> well it's working for you i Thanks. like it what are what are some of the from a leadership standpoint um uh management standpoint uh franchise or what are, what are you reading what are you listening to that you think might be helpful or maybe some of your favorite things that have an impact on your life that uh the audience might find helpful Oh man. Okay. I'm always reading. I read so much. I watch so many YouTube videos. Like I mentioned, do you read or do you do audible? I do a combination of both. It, same, it really depends. Same here. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, a lot of the YouTube stuff I've been watching has been Marie Forleo, Kyle Cease, that sort of stuff. Um, when I'm reading stuff on the computer, it's usually news. Um, mm -hmm. And I try not to get bogged down in the negative stuff on the news. I want to know what's happening. You know, Tesla bought a bunch of Bitcoin, how this is going to affect, you know, markets, you know, just so I'm aware of the space mm -hmm. around me. Then when so I How much time do you spend on that? Um, I probably say uh, an hour a day. Um, and then I have other readings that I do that are that are book readings. So I love, you know, Blue Ocean Strategy, mm -hmm. that, that one I re recently got a couple months ago, I regularly turn back to traction because of the nature of the business. Um, I really love stuff by Michael Lewis, which mm -hmm. is, um, you know, nonfiction, you know, uh, so that's sort of the fun stuff. And then, and then I've always got this time set aside for social media and I'm talking like junk social media, like TikTok, <laughs> you know, um, so that I can develop the, the right side of my yep. brain, which is your center of empathy and compassion. Um, traction our cfo tony who i'm doing in a, a podcast with uh today and will release in a, in a while but he said you have to read traction again he gave us as as co-founders and staff he's like everybody read traction again so i'll be diving in. it's been a long time since i've read traction i'm sure it will be very different because i'm implementing it now versus just theory when i first read it but i like some i like i like where you're going with that stuff i like kind of your routine as well any last bits of wisdom that you want to leave the audience with before i let you go um no really better like, be good it better be really good i okay, mean everyone really drops a huge value at this is where everybody drops a bunch of value so if it's if you don't have anything like super fire it's just gonna go boom. super fire okay so <laughs> okay so this is directed to the franchisor community out there anyone who's listening and this is what i'll say is sometimes but not always a founder can be a good franchisor. I'm going to repeat that. Sometimes, but not always, a founder can be a good franchisor. So are you? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. we can't leave at that because at some point, we the position outgrows us as the, as the company grows. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've seen different founders at different times that have stayed on too long. What's your zone of genius and when do you need to hire your, your own replacement? Yeah. What, what I like to think, you know, obviously time it and in living in a world where time and money isn't a constraint. If I'm hiring people, I like to hire people who um, have a skill set in a deficiency where, where I have a deficiency. You know, if I'm good at sales, I'm going to double down on that um, and get somebody to come in and be like the internal general counsel or whatever, because I'm not a legal guy. Um, but, you know, 
with the growth of a company, oftentimes a founder is kind of your stereotypical person that you see in the movies. This person who invents something and may know how the mechanics work and can maybe piece together a one-off business. But to become a franchisor, or even if you're not a franchisor, if you're just growing tons of corporate locations or something like Walmart or whatever, you need a totally different skill set and a totally different mindset. The dangerous part is sometimes a founder will be will will live in a world of ego will, where they'll say i did this i could do anything so i'll figure that out and it takes humility to know either when to step back and hire somebody else or when you are short on knowledge and you have to learn so that you can bring yourself up to that capacity uh that's awesome i'm going to sum it up with this and we're going to sign off ego is not your amigo <laughs> good to, good having you on robert Stay frosty, my friend. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.